Okay, we'll uh, get started. So, welcome back to the class after the break. Um, before the break, we did uh, KKT theorem, we did Lagrange multiplier theorem, and we did KKT theorem for constraint optimization problems with both equality as well as inequality constraints. Now, in the until mid November, no, not until mid November, until end of October. Our goal is to use that theory of Lagrange multiplier theorem and the KKD theorem. We will try to use that theory to come up with algorithms to solve optimization problems of that type. The first class of optimization problems that we want to study are inequality constraint problems. So I, so I have a problem where I want to minimize fx. x is in some convex set capital X such that g of x is less than or equal to 0. <clears throat> and I define a set, I have to satisfy an assumption that I define a set S such that x in capital X, gj of x is less than 0 for all j 1 to r. So s is non-empty. And every feasible point can be reached through this is something that I've already uh, mentioned in the previous class, so you don't have to write it down. I just wanted to remind you of this. So this was the assumption we need to place on this particular problem. So uh, you shouldn't have any isolated point at the boundary. That's what this assumption means. If you have an isolated point, you can't really reach that point through the interior of the set because it's an isolated point at the boundary. So we want to avoid that situation here in this particular, uh, in trying to solve this problem using what is known as barrier method, which is the topic for today's class. This was done in the previous previous class. <clears throat> the idea in the barrier method is I want to compute xk, which is argmin argument of the function plus epsilon times the barrier function b of x. How are b of x defined? So this is something we didn't cover in the previous class, so that's the new stuff from this class. So here is the properties of the barrier function. So within the constraint set, like in the interior of the constraint set, I want the barrier function to be pretty flat. But as it approaches the boundary, where gj of x is going to 0, it should blow up to infinity. Okay, So it should be flat, and then it should blow up to infinity. So what kind of barrier functions do we have which goes to infinity as something approaches 0? So it's not that difficult. So we have b of x. I think it's log barrier function. Uh, minus summation log, yeah. Minus summation j equals 1 to r log of minus gj of x. And then there is inverse barrier function. <coughs> Excuse me.
So this is the logarithmic barrier function and this is the inverse barrier function. Excuse me? Like why, why the negative sign? Oh, negative sign? Uh, actually, good question. So the reason why we have a negative sign is because I want the barrier function to be positive. So I want the barrier function to look like this. So if I don't have the negative sign and gj of x is going to 0, uh, this log will make it negative. So it goes to negative infinity. If we are minimizing something that goes to negative infinity, you know what's going to happen, right? <clears throat> so we want to have a barrier function that goes to positive infinity. This is what my B of x should look like. OK? So I hope you are all convinced that as gj of x, gj of x is less than 0, but I'm letting x uh, go to some point at the boundary so that gj of x is going to 0, in which case, no matter which constraint is becoming active, this barrier function is going to infinity. So even if one of the gj x goes to 0, this barrier function will start going to infinity. Okay, so it creates a barrier. Uh, so it creates a barrier at the boundary of the set. Okay, so you know in real world we have fence, right? So, so you have a plot of land and you put a fence around that plot of land. And uh, where is the fence? The fence is at the boundary. Okay, so no matter how you are approaching the boundary, there is a fence which will not allow you to cross that particular set. So the barrier function exactly serves as that fence. Okay, so the fence is sort of zero in the interior of the set. And as you get at the boundary, the fence goes all the way to infinity. Now that's of course an ideal barrier function. In the real barrier function, you want the barrier function to be differentiable and all that, uh, all that good stuff. It should be differentiable, it should be twice differentiable, you should be able to do gradient descent and all that stuff. So that's why you use, we use what is known as a smooth barrier function, which goes to infinity very smoothly, but it does go to infinity at the boundary. <coughs> yes, please. In both functions, if I put a negative high value of g there, okay, I don't see it going to the positive infinity. Which one? This one? Yeah, if I put a uh, negative high value, like minus one million. So right, so then this is just a small number. A negative small number. Right, that's fine. But this uh, value function shows that it should go to positive infinity power. At the boundary, so at the boundary this is going to zero. One of them is going to zero. So one boundary is zero, what about the other boundary? It doesn't matter, oh. so as soon as you reach the boundary it should go to infinity. Okay. Right? <coughs> So, so at this point, if, if you think of this classroom as a set, this is one boundary, right? And that is the other boundary. And then there is a point where the two boundaries are intersecting. So it doesn't matter whether I come to this boundary, I go to that boundary, or I go to that corner. The barrier is going to infinity all over the place. OK? <clears throat> now, this is not a smooth barrier. This is like a discontinuous barrier. So I can't do gradient descent with this. But if you imagine if this class was like this, I could actually do a gradient descent, right? It would be a funny classroom to teach in. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's the barrier function. So what all things do we need to worry about here? So what's the theory? The theory says <clears throat> you compute xk reduce the value of epsilon k, compute xk plus 1, reduce the value of epsilon k, compute xk plus 2, and so on. And this xk would converge to the optimal solution x star, as long as you can compute the argument. Of course, in real world, we don't compute the argument. We compute a stationary point of the objective function. And therefore, <coughs> the barrier method would eventually converge to a stationary point 
of the uh, objective function, which is minimize fx such that gx is less than or equal to 0. OK. <clears throat> so what all things do we need to worry about in this particular problem? So it's an iterative method. <clears throat> And at every point, so I pick the value epsilon naught, I have to solve an argument problem. How do you solve an argument problem? Well, you run gradient descent or you run optimization over convex set, a conditional gradient method. Or uh, so if x is, a, x is unconstrained, if x is Rn, you run the regular gradient descent or perhaps a Newton's method. If x is a, a convex set, then you run a uh, conditional gradient method or gradient projection method and so on. <clears throat> so I have, I have to worry about a few things. Even if everything was convex here, okay, so that the argument can be computed, I have to run infinite number of iterations to get to the minimum, right? We cannot get to the minimum in five or 10 iterations. You have done a lot of gradient descent by now. And you know that in one step, you don't reach the optimal solution. You have to take a few steps in order to get to the optimal solution. Well, even if you run like 10 steps, you are close to the optimal solution, but you're not at the argument yet, okay? But you just say, okay, fine, I'm, I'm close to the optimal, I'm gonna quit. So one problem is, I, don't, I cannot compute this argument exactly, so how many steps am I supposed to take? Should I take five steps? Should I take 10 steps? Should I take a, a million steps? I don't know, okay? So that's one question, question number one. How to compute argument? How many steps to take? And the question number two is, okay, now I have computed for epsilon naught I have taken a few number of steps. I have computed an approximate argument. How should I change? What, what should my epsilon one be? Should it be half of epsilon naught? Should it be 0 0.9 of epsilon naught? <coughs> or should it be 0 0.1 of epsilon naught? I don't know. So the question two is how to pick epsilon k plus one. Okay, so these are the two questions that we need to answer in order to be able to run this barrier method. And the way this algorithm will work, as I mentioned, for epsilon naught you compute x naught that serves as the initial condition for initializing the minimization problem for epsilon one, and then you get x one, that serves as the initial condition for initializing this minimization problem with epsilon two, and so on. So every time you get an optimal solution, you use that as an initial condition for the next optimization. So, so these are the two questions we need to worry about even if we have a broader understanding of how, what this optimization problem is doing. So we won't solve this problem in complete generality. Uh, it requires a lot, lot of domain knowledge, but for one situation, we can actually uh, get a very good understanding of this algorithm, and that is for linear programming. So I'm going to write the linear programming in standard form. I want to minimize C transpose X such that AX is equal to B x is greater than or equal to zero. So I'm going to define my set capital X <coughs> as this particular set, ax equal to b. So it's a convex set. So then this problem becomes minimize C transpose x, x is in capital X, x greater than or equal to zero.
Actually, I want to write it as inequality constraint in the other way, so I'm going to write it as minus x less than equal to zero. <coughs> Okay, so I need to pick a barrier function and I'm going to pick the logarithmic barrier function. So my B of X is minus summation of log of minus XI, I equals one to N. The algorithm that we are going to discuss, so uh, barrier method with logarithmic barrier function for linear programming problem, this is known as Kermarker's algorithm and it was devised in 1984. And this algorithm has the best theoretical performance for solving linear programming problem. Okay. So I'm going to define F epsilon X as C transpose X minus epsilon I equals one to N log of minus X I. Oh, it says log of, oh, I'm so sorry. So log of minus minus xi, so there should not be a minus sign here. And there should not be a minus sign here. Please erase the minus sign from the log in both these places. In b of x, there shouldn't be a minus sign here. In f epsilon of x, there shouldn't be a minus sign here. <coughs> Right, and my set capital S is X such that AX is equal to B and X is greater than zero. <coughs> Any questions so far? We are just tracing the steps of the barrier method. So we have created, we have the optimization problem. We have created the barrier function. We just picked the logarithmic barrier function, but you can pick any other barrier function that fits the bill. Uh, <coughs> then we define F epsilon X, which is C transpose X plus epsilon times the barrier function so the barrier function has a negative sign, that's why you see a negative sign here. But it's actually fx plus epsilon times bx. And I've defined my set capital S, which is x in capital X, such that x is strictly greater than zero. Okay? And at every time step, I need to solve this problem, uh, I want to minimize F epsilon X, X is in capital S. Okay. 
Now let's try to think about what exactly is this barrier function trying to do in this problem. So epsilon is a free positive parameter. I can pick epsilon anywhere between zero to plus infinity. So let's look at the set. So this is my set. Uh, not s, but this is my set x such that ax equal to b, x greater than equal to 0. And let's say that I pick a value of epsilon that is extremely large. Let's say I pick my value of epsilon to be a, a trillion, okay, or, or, or a trillion raised to a trillion. So epsilon is very large, it's close to infinity. What's the minimum value of F epsilon over the set capital S? So if this weight is extremely large, this is actually very small in comparison to this weight. And so minimizing F epsilon is equivalent to minimizing the summation of log of xi over this particular set, Ax equal to B set. So you get a point somewhere here, which I'm going to write as x infinity. <coughs> this is x infinity. So when epsilon is infinity, you get a point that is far away from all the boundaries, and this is on the set ax equal to b. And it's minimizing f of infinity x, okay, over the set capital S. Now what happens if I reduce the value of epsilon and I see, look at this particular path. This is my x infinity, this would be my x 100, this would be my x 10, this is my x 5, this is my x 3, this is my x 2, and so on. This is my x 0. Uh, well, I'm, maybe I screwed up. So. Uh, I, I'm using the subscript both as a index for x and I'm using it as an iteration number. What should I do? Maybe I should write it as x epsilon. Now it's better. x infinity, x 100, x 10, x 5. Okay, so for various values of epsilon, I can trace what the optimal x, x star epsilon should look like. So what do you notice? Yes, please. Right. And, and as you get, make epsilon smaller and smaller, it's actually tracing a path to the optimal solution. This is the optimal solution. This is actual x star. So it's basically tracing a path as you reduce the value of epsilon. And this path is known as central path. So once you fix A, B, and C, you have basically fixed the central path, okay? And now starting with a very large value of epsilon, what you want to do is, the barrier method is asking you to trace the central path, okay? So the barrier method says, I'm going to pick epsilon equals to 100, I'm going to compute x star 100, then I'm going to reduce the value to 10, epsilon equals to 10, and I'm going to use this as a starting point to run the conditional gradient method or a gradient projection method, and I want to get to x10. Then I'm going to reduce the value of epsilon to five, 
and I'm going to start with this as initial condition and I'm going to run conditional gradient des descent or gradient projection method and get to x5 and so on and so forth. And the barrier method says, if you do this algorithm, if you run this algorithm, you will converge to the optimal solution. That's what barrier method says. Now what's the problem with this method? The problem with this method is if you want to trace the central path exactly, you have to run infinite number of gradient projection methods or conditional gradient method to get to the central path and then get to this point and then get to this point and so on. So even if I know how to reduce the value of epsilon, some, some, some person told me how to reduce the value of epsilon, I still have to run infinite number of iterations and I don't have that much time. I have to do this assignment by this weekend or something like that. So I don't have that much time. I can't be tracing the central path. So what's the next best thing that you can do if you cannot trace the central path because you don't have that much time? To the optimal solution? But that's what we want to know, right? How to get to the optimal solution. So the barrier method is saying, in order to get to the optimal solution, you have to walk on the central path. There is some central path in this room, and I have to walk on that path in order to get to the optimal solution. What's the next best thing? To, so, so in order to walk that path, I have to take infinite number of iterations. I don't have that much time. Approximate central path, okay? So, <clears throat> The barrier method says, I need to go on the central path, but Ker Karmarkar says, uh, I don't have to go on the central path. I can actually approximately trace the central path. So this is the central path, and I'm not going to go along this particular direction. I'm going to go a little bit here, and then I'm going to go a little bit here, and then I'm going to go a little bit here, and this is the way I'm going to trace the central path. Not exactly, but approximately. Now the good thing with approximation is I don't have to take infinite number of steps to get to an approximate solution. I can do that in five steps or I can do that in three steps as you have done in your assignment one, two, and three. You don't have to take so many steps. Moreover, if you look at this objective function, it's actually a convex function. If you look at this constraint, it's actually a convex constraint. So you have a convex objective function with a convex constraint you can actually get very close to the optimal solution using Newton's method. And even though uh, tracing the central path is going to take infinite number of steps, I'm not going to take infinite number of steps. I'm going to approximately trace the central path. So I'm going to go like this. And I'm going to converse to the optimal solution eventually. OK? That's the idea of Kermaker's algorithm. Now comes another challenge. I don't know what the central path is, right? So once I give you A, B, and C, the central path gets decided according to this minimization problem. So, so the central path is decided, but I don't know if I'm on the central path, if I'm off the central path. There's no way to know how close or far I am from the central path. OK, so there is another problem that came up let me write it as question three. How do we know how far are we from the central path? The best way to think about it is, suppose I tell you that I have to go to Union, Ohio Union from Scott Lab. And there is one path which is the best path possible from going from here to Ohio Union. OK, best path. And I ask you to leave and, and, and walk towards Ohio Union, and you are taking a path. How do you know how close you are to the best path? OK, it's a difficult problem. So what Kermerker's algorithm does is it comes up with a way to assess how close or how far you are from the central path <coughs> and comes up with 
an algorithm in which you just take one Newton step at every point of time, change the value of epsilon, assess how far you are from the central path, and then pick another value of epsilon, and then take the one step of Newton's method. So you're doing just one step of Newton's method at every point of time. You're not solving this minimization exactly. You are just taking one Newton step. And you are assessing how far you are from the central path, which guides how to reduce your value of epsilon. And, and it, it runs the algorithm, and it converges to the optimal solution. And this method in 1984 was the best method, the fastest method, theoretically the fastest method for solving linear programming problem. OK? So let's, let's see how to. Let's see what exactly the algorithm is about. Any questions at this time? <clears throat> okay. All right, so in order to run gradient, so I don't have to run gradient descent. This is a convex problem. I can run Newton's method. So let's try and, uh, let's try and uh, solve the, like come up with a Newton's method for solving this constrained optimization problem. So I'm going to erase all of this. So I want to find out what gradient of epsilon x is. That is c minus epsilon 1 by x1, 1 by xn. What is the second derivative of f epsilon? That is 0 minus epsilon <coughs> Oh, I should probably remove the f mi minus sign. <coughs> So I'm going to define a matrix X as diagonal of X. So if I define my capital X as diagonal of the vector X, then I can write this as epsilon X minus 2. So inverse of x squared. OK. Now I have to do what is known as a Newton's method. But the Newton's, it's not an unconstrained Newton's method. Remember, S is a constrained set, AX equal to B, X greater than 0. So I have to do a constrained Newton step, just like we did in the case of, uh, what was that algorithm? Manifold sub-optimization method. There was a constrained Newton's method in that optimization problem. So we have to do the same thing here. and. So I want to solve the following problem. I want to minimize
a a z equals to b z greater than 0 and I want to minimize it over all such z <coughs> where have we seen this before so we have seen this expression this optimization before for affine scaling method and manifold sub optimization method and this was introduced in the Newton's method for constrained optimization problem. Um, so we have introduced this problem three times. So the way to solve this problem is to solve this problem iteratively. Okay. Uh, you have also implemented it in this particular al part in uh, your manifold suboptimization code, which, by the way, I uploaded my manifold suboptimization code. So I, I hope you have seen it and you have figured out where you may have gone wrong in the code. Now here is the trick. I have this constraint z greater than 0 which, which is a strict inequality constraint and I don't know how to solve this problem by hand. So I'm going to do this trick where I'm going to ignore this constraint completely. I'm going to ignore it and I'm going to solve the rest of the problem, which is minimize this quadratic approximation of the function uh, such that az equals to b. Turns out that I can solve it, uh, this particular problem, and that problem is let me write it. So x bar is given by x minus epsilon x square c minus epsilon minus a transpose lambda and lambda is given by x square okay so that's the optimal solution Yes, please. Uh, we don't know yet. Yeah, we don't know yet. Uh, I cannot ignore this inequality constraint yet. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I have ignored it. I have computed the solution because I can't compute it. Now I have to figure out when can I ignore this constraint, okay, based on the solution. So we'll get to it in a bit. <coughs> Actually, let me, uh, let me go ahead and tell you when can I ignore it. So epsilon is a free parameter that I can pick. X is strictly positive, and this is just a vector, OK? So I can pick epsilon sufficiently small so that x minus epsilon times a vector is strictly positive, OK? In which case, ignoring this constraint makes total sense. <coughs> Okay. Any other question? Okay, let me go over that argument again. So I have ignored this constraint z greater than zero, but epsilon here is a free parameter. I get to pick epsilon at every step of the iteration. 
I know that my x is strictly positive, like every element of x is strictly positive. The rest of the stuff is just a vector. So I can pick epsilon very, very small so that the vector, so x minus epsilon times this vector also has strictly positive entries. And if x bar has strictly positive entries, then it's also a solution to this particular problem with z greater than zero constraint. Okay. So now I'm going to rewrite this, but any other question before I proceed? No? Which step? Oh, this part? Uh, so go back and look at your notes from constraint optimization, optimization over convex set. So this was, there are few ways by which you can get this, uh, get this expression. The first is using Lagrange multiplier theorem. It's a convex problem. So you can just apply Lagrange multiplier theorem, you can get the same answer. Uh, it was also done in your assignment to problem one. Assignment to problem one, yeah. So you solved a problem of this type. Uh, do you remember that? Right? So you have seen this before in assignment to problem one. Uh, you have seen this in affine scaling method. You have seen this in manifold suboptimization method. So I'm using this expression for maybe like fifth time in this class. Yeah. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing that we have used before. No difference. Okay. Okay, uh, so now I'm going to do the following. I'm going to rewrite this expression a little bit because it's much easier to ex understand. So I'm going to write x bar equals to x minus capital X Q X epsilon and Q X epsilon is given by x times c minus a transpose lambda over epsilon 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so this is one Newton step at x. <clears throat> let me uh, let me draw the diagram again. This is the central path. And I'm uh, sitting here, this is my x, this is my x star epsilon. So I have an epsilon, I'm sitting at x, which is far away from the boundary. And I want to take one Newton step. This is one Newton step, and I get here, which is my x bar. Okay, now everyone understands this step. So I'm sitting at x, I have picked my epsilon to be the parameter of interest. I take just one Newton step, only one Newton step. This is one Newton step for the constrained optimization problem. So I take one Newton step and I reach x bar 
which hopefully is closer to X star epsilon, hopefully, okay? We still need to check. Well, actually my hope is, is, is not unfounded. I know that this is a convex problem. If I run like Newton's step five times, I will converge to the optimal solution. Uh, well, I'll get close to the optimal solution because Newton's method is very fast. So, uh, so my hope is, is, is actually a very good, uh, is, is founded on solid theory. It's not just some random thought I have in mind. Okay, now you see one important thing here. So x bar and x are related to this quantity q of x comma epsilon. q is actually a vector, okay? So this x is a matrix, this q is a vector. And so, uh, so I can write, I can rewrite this expression in the following way. I can write q of x comma epsilon as minus x inverse x bar minus x, x bar minus x. Okay, so q is a vector. And this vector can be written as uh, the Newton step minus x multiplied by x inverse and multiplied by a negative sign. <clears throat> I can also rewrite it as x inverse x minus x bar. So it's the same, same expression. Now here is the important thing that I want you to think about. What happens when the norm of this vector is small? What happens when the norm of this vector is small? I have a vector which is given by this expression and Remember, x bar equals to x minus capital X times this vector. And my question to you is, I'm doing this optimization, and I found that the norm of this particular vector is small. What does that mean? You're not going too far away from x. You're not going too far away from x. So why would that happen? Why would you not go too far away from x when you're taking a Newton step? Uh, no, so let's, let's, let's redo this particular picture differently. Let's say my x was right here, okay? And this is my optimal point, x star epsilon. Where will my x bar be? X bar will be, x bar will be somewhere between x and this x star. Remember that x bar is trying to compute this x star. So my x bar will be somewhere in between. So if Q is small, then it means that X bar and X are close to each other. When, is, when do we have that X bar and X are close to each other? Which means that successive Newton iterates are close to each other. When would that happen? When you're basically on the central path. Yeah, when you, are, when you are very close to the central path, that's exactly what would happen. So now, how difficult is it to compute this vector? Not difficult at all. You have to compute X bar. You know X already you know capital X, which is diagonal of X, this vector X. So actually it's not that difficult to compute Q of X epsilon. And, and it's also not difficult to take the norm of Q of X epsilon and know that it is small or, or large. If it is large, you are far away from the central path. If it is small, you are very close to the central path. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so what we have discussed so far is the following, uh, I don't want to say claim because claim is a mathematical statement. Uh, let me call it intuition, okay? So this is the intuition we have come up with. If Q x epsilon is small, 
I'm, I'm using the two norm here. So, okay, I'm not going to write two norm everywhere, but it's implicitly assumed that it's two norm. Is small, then uh, x is, or x bar is close to central path. I mean, both x and x bar are close to central path, okay? But certainly x bar is very close to the central path. <clears throat> okay. Yes, please. Why would we take more than one for each other? Right. So we'll get to it towards the end of the discussion, which is next uh, on, on Wednesday. Okay, any other question? So I'm standing at x, I take one Newton step, and I compute this Q of x epsilon, which is given by this expression. And if the norm of Q is small, then I know that I'm close to the central path. And what will happen when I know that I'm close to the central path? I'm going to change the value of epsilon. I'm going to reduce the value of epsilon. On the other hand, if I'm far away from the central path, I'll probably run a few Newton steps to get close to the central path. And once again, when my norm of Q is small, I know that my X bar is close to the central path, I'm going to change the value of epsilon. And that's exactly what the, uh, the barrier method is going to do. So here is what we will do in the next class. Uh, I'm going to use this, this theoretical mumbo jumbo. Well, all of this is not, not needed for the next class. All is needed for the next class is these two expressions. So I'm going to start from these expressions and I'm going to tell you a series of results, actually three results, which will basically tell you that every time you're changing the value of epsilon or you're changing the value, you're taking one Newton step, uh, you will always remain close to the central path and in the limit, you will converge to the optimal solution. So only one Newton step, change the value of epsilon, then one Newton step, then change the value of epsilon. So you can exactly uh, figure out in how many steps you will get close to the optimal solution. So we are going to study those series of results in the next class. I'm not going to prove anything. The proofs are there in the book, and they are pretty long and convoluted. Uh, but I'm not going to do the proofs, but I'm going to write the statement of the theorem so that you understand how exactly did Karmalkar prove that his algorithm converges to the optimal solution. So I'll see you guys on Wednesday. and. Have a great Tuesday.